I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast and welcome indeed to our new Monday slot. This week I'm speaking to esteemed entomologist Dr Ian Bedford about accepting the insects in your garden and learning to accept their vital role in the wider ecosystem. We talk about how gardens can work alongside public spaces to provide habitats for beleaguered bugs, how we can reconcile growing food with welcoming bugs and whether reports of insectageddon are justified. I'm pleased to introduce you to Ian too because starting today there will be a slot at the end of each episode where Ian talks about his bug of the week. It will usually be a bug that's just emerged in your garden that week. Obviously this is more accurate for UK listeners but hopefully it'll be of interest to listeners outside the UK too because Ian often brings in wider issues. So on with the interview. I started by asking Ian which bugs most need our help. Um, Well I think within the bug world um, we're seeing massive declines right across the, the planet with, with, with bugs that really all, all of them need, need our help because they're all part of that food chain, which, you know, it starts off really down, you know, with, with the plants and then you get the bugs that feed on those and the bugs that feed on the other bugs. And eventually those are the bottom parts of those really important food chains uh, and, you know, which should exist in all our environments. Yeah, so the, the, the importance of um, maintaining these food webs, which, um, or these food chains rather, which then link together to make food webs, um, it, it is absolutely crucial to, to whether the, um, the ecosystems can be sustained into the future. And it, we, we, we have to all accept this and we have to realise that nowadays all parts of our um, ecology have a, have a role to play within the ecology and we can all do something to help and the days i think are gone when you just pick up you know a can of bug killer or a grower goes out and gets the most toxic product he can to just spray on his crops because it's the knock-on effect for the rest of that ecosystem that has to be taken into account so to answer that question i think anything really in the bug world needs to be um, helped at the moment to re-establish healthy food chains and food webs um, and when you say that the days are gone of picking up these sprays, do you think they have genuinely gone because people aren't doing it or have they gone because we can't possibly carry on like that and we need to change? I think the information relating to them has, has become uh, more accessible now and uh, people are aware of the consequences of where you know pesticides have been used and linked to you know some serious diseases that, and, and illnesses that growers and and users of these pesticides have had and we've seen some incredible disasters around the world with you know pesticide um companies where things have have gone wrong and there's been leaks and yeah people have died and in fact a a lot of the chemicals that have been used in the past actually originated from um the wars where they were used to, to, to kill soldiers so i think people's awareness to this and having to you know be able to see the decline in insects um within their own gardens and you've only got to drive down a road in your car now to see that you know the windshield just doesn't get the amount of bugs splattered on it as there was a few years ago so it is quite obvious that we have a problem and it's all about teaching people what they need to do to improve this so that the environment can really get back to normal and what's really interesting i think you know in these days of lockdown when the, the traffic has been so so much reduced on our roads we're very rapidly seeing numbers start to rise with some species. So it's a great indicator that, you know, it doesn't take much to try and get things back on track again. And so, you know, I, I really do feel that that's uh, an opportunity now for people to think about what they do in the future and to try and particularly where they own a garden, to garden in a more environmentally friendly manner. Mm. And as somebody who is a champion of bugs, um, what do you think are some of the best and worst habits that us gardeners have that either help or hinder insects? <laughs> well, almost certainly it's uh, the, the thing when you first start to see your flowers and your plants starting to grow in, in spring and they get aphids on them. And so many people up, up until recently have just said, right, where's the bug killer? Let's get rid of them. Let's kill them off. And they don't think that they're there for a purpose because those first 
flush of insects that are actually, say, on the, on the developing rosebuds, are there to enable things like the blue tits to collect insects for their young. It's all timed so that other organisms have a food source. So that's one of the things, you know, that, that I, I think people um, do wrongly. They, you know, they, they, when they, they see something, they, they immediately think, let's kill it, rather than think about what its role in the environment is. And it goes with a lot of other things as well. You know, people worry when they see flying ants, for example, in the summer. Well, you know, what, that's only the, the time when those ants' nests release their new um, reproductive ants. And it's a great time for the birds, which are actually due to migrate south again, things like the swallows, the swifts and the house martins, to actually have a massive feed and, and to really sort of build up their energies on these flying ants. So, you know, instead of putting pests and boiling water over ants' nests, which I've seen lots of people do, just let them be because it's just a, you know, once or twice a year event that is part of nature. Yeah, some, I spoke to somebody on Sunday, actually, who was talking about pouring boiling water on ants, and, oh, it's a horrible thought. But um, I guess sort of switching from the the insects themselves and thinking about more the plants, um, do you think there are any plants, well, that you can think of that are fairly common but do little or nothing to provide a food source or habitat? And I guess I'm thinking more about the ornamentals that we might grow in our gardens. Yes. Um, well, there's, there's been um, a, a, tr- a trend, I guess, not so much now because people are more aware of this, but to, to buy flowers that are big blooms, massive colours, but they're these flowers which often double blooms that where the insects can't get any access to nectar or pollen. So really all they're doing there is having these flowers which just look pretty in the garden but serve no purpose for for the pollinating insects. I mean, they might be okay for insects that feed on the leaves, but then again, you know, many people would think they've got pests and want to get get rid of them. So um, I'd always say go for the plants um, which you actually see insects actively visiting. And whenever I go to a garden centre and decide, you know, I'm going to buy some plants for the garden, I'm always looking around to see which things are in flower and which things are buzzing with the insects because I know then that when you bring them back home and plant them in your garden, you're gonna you're gonna be doing some good for for, for the good insects. Sir. And yeah, actually, you mentioned trends, and it made me think about the trend for planting grasses, particularly um, grasses from probably a North American um, climate. How are they for insects? Do mm. they provide any use? Well, I, I think they do actually, because they can always be grown in amongst other plants. They offer some great shelter. In fact, only the um, last year I, I had a, a pamphus grass, which was a little bit too big, and I decided to just slice it down and, and move it. And as I was slicing through it, I came within a, um, a millimetre of chopping through a couple of frogs that were in the middle of it, <laughs> and they'd obviously spent the winter there. So they provide a great habitat, you know, shelter-wise. But also, a lot of our brown butterflies, um, their larvae feed on grasses. And we think that we're seeing more of these brown butterflies in people's gardens now because they're able to feed on these ornamental grasses. So, again, that's a good thing. But the thing we need to be really, really careful of is that when we buy plants to put into the garden, we can see the positives, like I've just said about, you know, the shelter and the possibility of it being a food plant for um, for butterfly caterpillars. But we need to make sure it hasn't been treated with long lasting systemic pesticides because, a lot of the um, retailers have been selling plants that are already treated with these pesticides to ensure that they haven't got bugs on them when people come to buy them from their shops. And I know the year before last, um, Sussex University um, undertook a study to look at um, all the flowering plants that were coming out of places, you know, the big uh, retail stores, the sheds, the nurseries and that. And they found, I think it was 76% of the plants that were being sold as good for pollinators, even had the RHS stamp of approval, contained neonicotinoid um, systemic pesticides. So that's not only um, bad for the environment, I think it's highly annoying as well that you would be going out and spending good money on plants that you think are going to be great for the environment in your garden, but in fact they're actually providing a toxic um environment for for pollinating species 
Yeah, I did interview Dave Goulson actually um, on the podcast, and he was talking about that. And and like you say, it's 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 upsetting that people think they're doing good, and actually they end up doing harm. Um, you know, and that's not good. But talking about sprays, um, I wanted to ask you if you think that if we want to encourage wildlife, are all pesticides a no no, and are any are there any that are safe? I mean, some people uh, think that garlic spray is a really good kind of, um, you know, insecticide. What are your thoughts on those? Right, well, I've never come across, I mean, I, I do a lot of talks to, to garden clubs and horticultural societies each year, and I've never come across anybody who's had a good, valid reason for using a chemical spray within a garden environment. There's, there's always a safe in, um, alternative for them to use. And, but if you did want to spray, um, there are certain things there which are acceptable. Some of the soap-based products, for example. Um, there's a product actually called um, SB Plant Invigorator that's um, been, been used by many commercial growers and um, gardeners now because it's a, a mixture of soaps that are plant-safe and doesn't cause what we call phytotoxic damage. But it washes off um, small sap-sucking insects such as the aphids, the thrips, the spider mites, white fly, um, and doesn't harm any of the beneficial, the more robust insects that are actually on there feeding on them. So these are called, you know, these sort of safe options. Um, but the trouble is a lot of the products that you go into a garden center to buy are just simply called bug killer. And people think, oh, well, because it's easily accessible from the shelf and it's got a nice friendly name, it'll be fine. But if you look at the small print on the back, and look at the active ingredient, you'll actually be able to see whether it is a chemical or a soap. And I think that's what people ought to really do, you know, to actually scrutinise the backs of things. If they don't want something that's a, a, a broad spectrum killer, such as the pyrethrums or the neonicotinoids, which um, are sold as sort of thioclopride, acetamapride, there's a lot of these chemical names which are associated with those, um, then they need to be told that and uh, one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is to get garden centres to to join a little sort of um, a group where we we get them to set aside part of the garden centre as a green area where customers can go in and they have total confidence that all the products that are being sold in this particular area are not harmful in any way to the beneficial life in the gardens. So they have the option. They can go to the side and buy these broad spectrum pesticides if they wanted to, but they could go to the other side and buy the safe ones. Going back to what you said about the garlic sprays, you know, making your own things, um, for me to endorse that on the radio or, or on a podcast would be illegal <laughs> because <laughs> you're not allowed to actually <laughs> do that. It's, it's, it's a way of the government um, uh, regulating the fact that people don't go out and, and create these things, which could potentially be very poisonous. I mean, we know that things like um, the castor oil plant, for example, which a lot of people grow in their gardens, is one of the most deadliest poisons in its, seed, in its seeds known to man. So you don't want somebody to think, oh, well, I'll get those seeds, I'll crush them all up and boil off the, 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 the boil down the um, uh, the liquid and then spray it on things because <laughs> half, <laughs> half the village will be dead. <laughs> but So that's that's really the reason for it. But common sense prevails. So you, you know that if you're, if you're eating garlic, you can eat it raw, what, what harm are you really going to do if you were to crush garlic up into a liquid and spray it on a plant? Well, that's your decision at the end of the day. And I think it's also down to you to decide whether it works or not, because having studied a lot of different types of natural products in my in my time as a, as a research entomologist, I, I know that there's lots of other factors which govern whether they're going to work or not. And that's down to the environmental conditions, um, and, and the particular pest that, and the plant that you're actually trying to spray. Okay. Um, so I was thinking about gardeners and the advice that we get for our gardens. And I wondered if maybe we need to know more about the ecosystems that are specific to our gardens. So um, there are region specific species and mm. there are, you know, species of insects that need particular conditions. And sometimes we think that we're just kind of, because we're applying this broad brush advice of let's 
plant lots of plants for pollinators let's encourage bees let's encourage this that and the other I wonder if sometimes maybe we forget that we are part of a a region that has a very specific ecosystem and sometimes we need to know a bit more in order to apply the right advice do you think that's a valid concern absolutely I think that's a very very um, sensible question to ask actually because you're right you know in different regions you get different um different ecosystems different uh, um organisms that live within that and the last thing you want to be doing is planting things to try and attract something that's just never going to appear you might as well put something in that's going to help help the environment in that particular region and i think it's a case of actually standing back a little bit and looking to see what's going on around the area i mean where where i live you know we're very close to a big lake we've got some open fields where i know there's a certain type of butterflies um, uh, population there we're, we're near the norfolk broads where again there's lots of um insects which, which which like water so by building a pond in the garden very very quickly i start to see the dragonflies and the damselflies and, uh, and those types of things coming along so you can actually you know complement and add to that environment by just stepping back and spending a little, a little bit of time looking at it and seeing how you can actually add to it rather than creating something that's just totally um, different to, to what's there. So definitely do that. It's a, it's, it's a very important thing. And I always look on the, the gardens as being like little stepping stones as well, because one of the big problems we have now is with, with so many new houses being built and whatever, it means that an area gets divided up into lots of little small locations, little perhaps small nature reserves and things. And it's very difficult for, for the wildlife within one nature zone to move to another one. And what happens over time is because they're all sort of, um, you get a lot of inbreeding, that they're sort of contained in that particular area, and they're geographically isolated. The populations become quite, sort of different. And, and in the long term, you actually can end up with different what we call biotypes, which actually aren't compatible and don't interbreed. So you need to really make sure that wildlife is moving between these different areas. And, and people are very much aware of the need for that. And I think with home gardens, you can almost use them as stepping stones between these wildlife zones. So by getting the environment right, the wildlife is able to, to move its way through into new locations. And we're actually seeing that with um, things like these bee highways that are being set up to enable the, the, the pollinators to spread right across the countries. I was looking at one the other day that's being set up in Wales. Absolutely amazing. So, you know, definitely that's something that we need to make sure we can do. And everybody who's got a garden or even, you know, to be honest, a, a patio or, or even a balcony, there's no reason at all why things can't be grown in pots, which actually complement the local environment. So, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that might stray into very difficult territory because one of my f later questions, which I'll come on to now, was, you know, do does there need to be a dialogue between public and private land owners and do we need to be collaborating more so that we can increase that network of habitats? But then it kind of had me thinking, oh, you know, if somebody came along and said to somebody, oh, you know, we have got this public park, which you're next door to, we feel that you should incorporate this. I can very see quickly see that becoming, a, you know, a real issue where people would feel that maybe the government or local authorities were interfering in their personal space. So I guess it's more finding a positive way for that collaboration to happen. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that would cause uh, a lot of potential problems. But it's not to say that, you know, the, the sides of the um, of the roads can't be managed properly by the council so that they are grown with wildflowers and that they don't chop them down at the wrong times of year. Because that's, that's one of the biggest problems that we've been having around here is that some absolutely amazing wildflower zones have been set up. And then you're seeing all this this life, the butterflies, the bees and everything in there. And then the next day you come along and somebody has gone through with a, with one of these great big lawnmower things and cut it all down and taken away all the cuttings. Mm. And you think, how crazy. Yeah. <laughs> all that effort that's gone into establishing that and allowing all the wildlife to be to, to start to populate it has just been killed off in, <laughs> in an afternoon. Yeah. So 
and looking on you know the social media i mean I, I'm, I'm on um, on twitter and you, you you see a lot of pictures being sent where people said i can't believe what's just happened and, and there's a before and after picture of, of where exactly the same thing has happened in other parts of the country so but public pressure on on the authorities will hopefully enable them to have strategies which actually help the environment rather than work against it and okay there's going to be the private landowners which like you've said you know you can't dictate to them what to do but i think there's an awful lot of people who live in their own little houses with gardens who would would welcome being part of that big jigsaw puzzle that that can help and, and they can always add their little bit to this to to to, to help and but it does involve people just working together as a community and being aware of the facts, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, yeah, same thing around here this week. As soon as the council workers have obviously been able to work safely, um, they've just gone round all of the verges on the roads of where I drive regularly and they've all been cut in the last week. So, um, you know, t- they've mm-hmm. taken out all sorts of, of lovely stuff. But, you know... It is a problem, um, and we do need to keep on badgering, I think. Um, so thinking about um, our gardens and how they would form part of a wider landscape, um, I think one of the things that I, I come up against occasionally is when people are growing food. And I think there a lot of people who grow food very much understand that growing the food is part of a wider picture and that they need to maybe fit their activities in with you know kind of how everything works on a grand scale but there are definitely people I think who think who feel that um you know having a lot of wildlife in your garden and growing food are not compatible how do you feel about that um well it does require a little bit of planning um that and but there's never a situation I don't think which can't be managed you can get to the point where, where it's, it's very difficult to manage. And I had that situation myself back in 2012 when my garden was invaded by um, a, Span- uh, a slug species called the Spanish slug, which uh, came in and basically just decimated everything. I mean, one morning I actually collected 350 six inch slugs off my lawn in half an hour. Wow. And they'd gone right through my vegetable patch. They, they just destroyed virtually everything it was just amazing even in the greenhouse sitting on all the tomatoes eating the tomatoes and it just had erupted with slugs and these things had a very wide omnivorous diet um so basically there wasn't sort of certain food they'd eat and certain food they didn't they just went through everything but rather than cover my garden in slug pellets which you know a lot of people told me i ought to do i, I just regularly started to pick these up morning and night by hand and it took a number of years to get on top of it but the spanish slugs are still in my garden now in very very low numbers but whenever i see one it's collected and disposed of it's as i said an invading species so i don't have any problems in getting rid of it um in fact it does actually eat native snails and slugs so you know by by trying to control it myself um i think i'm doing some good for my garden environment but saying that I've also seen, and and it's been reported to me by some other people as well, that the birds are adapting to the Spanish slug um, and and accepting it as a possible new food source because one of its biggest problems was it produces so much slime that most of the slug predators in northern Europe just wouldn't touch it. Things like the birds, the reptiles, the hedgehogs, because of the amount of slime it produced. But we've seen blackbirds picking them up and wiping them on the lawn now. (laughs) to wipe the slime off and then they can fly off with them and uh, so you know nature has a way of learning and 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 adapting and and from something that's a massive evading problem actually <laughs> can become a really good um food source for certain wildlife so where where the slugs have been in low numbers and the spanish slugs are there great great for the blackbirds and the thrushes and <laughs> yeah. i haven't seen frogs <laughs> wiping them all yet i wiping them all yet <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's what I've picked up in the past and you cannot wash the slime off your hands however hard you try. It takes ages. They are really slimy. I wonder if that's them. Yeah, well, actually, it's a good tip for that because um, the, the, the slugs and snails make the slime. They've got these li- these liquid crystals that are inside their bodies and 
they, they have to absorb the water. And that then uh, these uh, expand 100 times into slime. And that's what forms the slime. So if you get the slime in your fingers, it naturally absorbs water. So that's why you, you can't wash oh. it off. So the, the, the simplest way to get rid of slime is to put talcum powder on your hands and just rub it. And then it dries up the slime. Because, you know, if you get a slug that comes indoors and walks across the, or slimes across the carpet, it leaves a trail. Yeah. You just, you just vacuum it up. It goes into, into dust. Oh. So, yeah, so, so that's uh, what happens when it's dry. Oh. Um, so, so use talcum powder. Ingenious. Simplest way. I thought I might have to break out the swarfiga. <laughs> <That's not horrible. laughs> no, oh, that's just talcum powder. powder. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I shall, I shall make a note of that. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, you were talking earlier about um, kind of insects on windscreens and things, and that is something that a lot of people quote as a, an example of, you know, invertebrate numbers declining. Mm. How bad is insectageddon? Is it, you know, are reports exaggerated or is it really that bad? Um, that's, that's a difficult question to answer because I think I, it sells newspapers, you know, insect that get him, whatever it is, <laughs> and, uh, and these sort of headlines um, are always popular. But as we've seen with this lockdown, insect populations are very quick to recover once you actually take out the factor that's reducing them. And I think the ban on, on certain long-term pesticides, you know, the neonicotinoids on, on field crops has been a great help because we're not now seeing so much um, killing going on in, in, in the fields with those um, types of pesticides. But there's also, and it's become clear with certain species, that the climate is having a great effect on insect numbers as well. And I've been seeing this in particular with one, one butterfly species, the, the small tortoiseshell butterfly. It used to be one of our most popular butterflies, but and the year before last, there were quite a few in the gardens. I, I grow buddlies, especially for those long-tongued butterflies. And and then we had a spell which it became incredibly hot. It was just like uh, you know, the sort of temperatures you experience down in southern Spain. And almost overnight, the small tortoiseshells disappeared. Other butterflies, you know, the peacocks and the um, the, the, the cabbage whites and that, fine, they, they were around. But you also see the peacocks and the small tortoiseshells in southern Europe, which you don't see so much of the small tortoiseshells. So it was telling me that these butterflies are more of a temperate adapted, a tem- you know, butterflies are adapted to a more temperate climate. So when the temperatures got past a certain level, it was, they were uncomfortable. And I, I wasn't sure whether they, they died or whether they just sort of hunkered down. They go into, a, many insects go into a thing called estivation when it gets too hot, they mm-hmm. just close down. But the next year, the same thing happened. There wasn't so many small tortoiseshells, but as soon as we got the hot spell, they vanished again. So climate definitely has, I think, a, a, a role to play in what we're seeing in the changes in the environment. And when, and when something is lost from um, a, a, an ecosystem, it takes a while for that ecosystem to fill its space. But something will come along, and we've seen that with dragonflies as well. We've had some species of dragonflies which have been lost and they think down to climate change, but other ones are coming in from Europe. There's damselflies uh, as well that uh, have been, have been um, doing this and, and they replace the lost species. So it's a quite a dynamic situation, I think, but governed by the environment. But it does also mean that we're seeing um, problematic pests coming in. And when they move into a new area, like with the Spanish slug, they come in without their own natural enemies, which they've evolved within their country of origin. And they can cause a problem for a while. And um, particularly with there's a, a virus transmitting white fly that I was studying down in southern Spain when I was working as a, as a professional entomologist. And um, over the years that I was working with that, it moved from, you know, to southern Portugal, um, along, you know, the, the sort of uh, Andalusia area of Spain right up north to, to um, southern Spain, just in the sort of 10 years that I was working there. So things are on the march into more sort of temperate regions, and I think because of the changing environment. Yeah, yeah, definitely things are changing, and like, uh, it, which is fine if things, as you say, can fill the niche or adapt quickly enough, but the worry is, I guess, that, that, that maybe they're not. Um, mm. 
Okay, well, Ian, thank you for that. That's amazing. I just wanted to um, introduce your segment, which is going to be added to the end of each podcast episode going forwards. And it is you talking about uh, a bug of your choice. Would you just like to explain a little bit about it and, um, and maybe tell people what you hope they gain from listening to it? Yeah, well, um, part of my um, work since I sort of left professional entomology was to go out and talk to people about the bug world. And that also involved going out to garden clubs and garden shows, holding pest clinics and uh, giving talks uh, in the speaker's tents and that. And I've been invited down um, to to Toby Buckland's um, festival, which is held in Powderham Castle near Exeter um, every year, every every sort of uh, springtime. And got to know Toby quite well. I'd known him from some years previously, but uh, you know, got on really well. And um, he then started to um, have his own radio show on Sunday mornings on um, BBC Devon. And it's uh, well, at the moment it's a four-hour show. I'm not sure it's going to continue, but uh, it's four hours. But within that, he wanted a little piece recorded by me um, about a bug, and he calls it the entomologist who entertains. So. I uh, had to scratch my head and think of a, a bug which I could uh, talk about and record a little, you know, one or two minute session for him and send it down and he'd play that out each Sunday morning. Um, well, I think we're up to about number 65 at the moment, but so it's been going on quite a long time and, and they're actually getting longer and longer. So I think most of them are about three and three and a half minutes now, but it's great because it enables me to talk to people about a certain bug and, hopefully a topical one to the time of year when when the, when the uh, piece is broadcast and just explain yeah you know, a little bit more about them and hopefully get people to when they're going out gardening in their gardens to to look around them and to think ah i've heard about that on the radio so it's not just a a little bug that will squash it's actually got a very very interesting life stage and um it is you know it's just making people aware of the fascinating side of you know the wonderful entomology that's that's out there for us all to see in our gardens a very big thank you to ian i hope his advice has helped you to see the bug bigger picture i'd like to mention that this episode marks the second birthday of the podcast if you're enjoying the show and you would like to help me celebrate and give a birthday present to roots and all please do leave me a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts and that would be hugely helpful to me and to other people who are looking for podcasts as it will raise the profile of the show And now I'd like to unveil the new feature of the show, Bug of the Week. Here's Ian talking about some tiny critters that have just started appearing in my house and on my clothing this week, frog hoppers. Commonly seen on plants and bushes throughout spring and summer are little blobs of froth that we rather amusingly call cuckoo spit. Unlike the name suggests though, the blobs of froth don't come from a cuckoo, or in fact the mouth of any other creature, but come from the rear end of the nymphs of a group of sap-sucking insects that we call frog hoppers. Adult frog hoppers are no bigger than a quarter of an inch in length and have pointed heads on tapered bodies that resemble the shape of a squatting frog. They also have powerful back legs for propelling themselves into the air at over 13,000 feet per second to travel 150 times their body lengths in just one hop. There's 10 different species of frog hopper in Britain and all apart from one that's red and black, the adults are an earthy brown in colour, making them quite hard to see when they appear during late summer to mate and lay their overwintering eggs on the plant stems before they die. During spring, the eggs will hatch into little nymphs that are usually pale green in colour, but very delicate and vulnerable to predation. So to protect themselves, they each create a frothy blob of cuckoo spit to live within, formed by mixing expelled air into the waste fluids they excrete whilst feeding. Collectively, frog hoppers can be found on a vast range of plant species throughout the countryside and gardens, but they never infest plants in large enough numbers to cause any significant damage. And if cuckoo spit is deemed unsightly, a quick squirt from the garden hose will quickly remove it, along with the nymph. However, in recent months, Britain's native frog hoppers have become the focus of attention from the UK's plant health authorities. And government-funded research 
is now underway to record and map the locations where native frog hoppers can be found in Britain. The purpose of this study is to understand their population dynamics and to be prepared should a bacterial plant disease called Xylella ever appear in the UK in the future. The Xylella bacteria can be acquired and transmitted by frog hoppers if they feed on an infected plant. And this disease has been causing serious problems within southern Europe and on other continents for quite some time, with some olive groves being particularly affected. But although Xylella has not been recorded in Britain yet, measures are in place to prevent the importation of certain plants and diseases that might be carrying the disease. And of course, knowing more about the distribution of our native frog hoppers should Xylella ever appear in Britain will be of great value should we need to prevent it spreading in the future. Thanks for that, Ian. And thanks to you too for listening. Let me know what you think about the new segment. And don't forget, if you'd like to provide feedback on the podcast, please feel free to email me, podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Have a great week. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website, www.rootsandall.co.uk, where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter, which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.